I won't have anything to say about WARF in this talk. That's for the next talk. Um, but I will say that um, if any of you are interested in experiments on linguistic relativity or linguistic determinism, um, this is a literature that I like to keep up with. And I've taught a few honors seminars on languages, categories, and cognition. So if you are looking for something to talk about during the coffee break, I'm happy to have conversations about it. Okay. Um, but this is not that. Um, so is this working? Do I have to? No. Um, by the age of four or five, uh, we now know um, children display much of the linguistic expertise as adults do in syntax and semantics. So um, at this point, this is very different than 20 or 30 years ago, at this point, we kind of yawn and we're like, of course children know how to do this. Um, surprising that they have this ability by four or five, um, but we now know that they can do a lot of things like um, deliver um, interpretations of sentences involving quantifier raising, which is an abstract covert movement um, of quantificational phrases and other um, types of um, degree phrases, for example, throughout the grammar. Um, they also appreciate the ambiguity of question-answer relations and much, much more. This is just to give you a glimpse of the kind of complicated syntactic and semantic operations that they have um, exhibited an ability to, um, to access. A glaring except of the, um, you know, compared to the way that children and adults um, pattern together in other areas, um, is in pragmatics. So children have been observed to lag behind adults in their ability to initially deploy pragmatic reasoning. Um, so I, I use the adverb initially in there because what I hope to do is show you a host of evidence that shows they diverge from adults and then show you a host of evidence that um, illustrates that they actually pattern quite like adults if you um, add in a little bit more support. So the most notable case of children patterning differently than adults um, is with scalar implicatures. So um, this morning's talks and the um, introduction to this afternoon's session um, gave us a glimpse of implicatures, and I'm going to be talking specifically about one sort of implicature, with the, which is scalar implicatures, a type of quantity um, maxim reasoning. Um, so I'm giving you a glimpse of the papers and researchers um, who have uh, provided really beautiful evidence showing that children and adults um, don't pattern in a similar way across a number of different paradigms. Um, but these same researchers, um, myself included, have also shown that children and adults do pattern alike in other ways. But of course, scalar implicatures are not the only kind of pragmatic reasoning in which we engage. So um, what I'd like to do today is to begin what we currently know about children's ability to calculate scalar implicatures and engage in pragmatic reasoning beyond scalar implicatures. So I'm going to use scalar implicatures as kind of a starting point to show you um, children failing. And then we're going to move towards um, cases where they're succeeding. The range of evidence will provide us with the state of the art of research in this area and highlight the benefits both of focusing on the methodological aspects in assessing scalar implicatures in children and adults and also of moving beyond scalar implicatures. So I don't want to give you the impression that we should not be focusing on scalar implicatures anymore. On the contrary, you should focus on them in order to see what kind of methodological changes can um, affect performance. Um, but it's also beneficial to move beyond them and to broaden our research to look at other areas of pragmatic reasoning. Um, so just for the, the students in the room, faculty, I don't care about you right now, um, students, <laughs> I'd like to know how many of you have read any of the experimental literature on children's comprehension of scalar implicatures? Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> good. All right. Okay, so first I'm going to review the experimental evidence concerning children's developing acute scalar implicatures, which I'm going to abbreviate as SIs. The results will reveal that children appear to lag behind adults in their ability to calculate SIs. However, further results demonstrate that this ability improves under certain conditions and that children are sensitive to implicature calculation. And then I'm going to present results from other studies on SIs uh, the demonstrate that children quite easily assign upper bounds or upper bounded meaning um, when they don't have to rely upon lexical scalar alternatives. And that this ability varies depending on the lexical item, the linguistic environment in which it appears, and the linguistic background of the participant. So I'm going to be showing you um, results from monolingual children and from Spanish-English bilingual children. 
Um, and then I'll close by very briefly mentioning other areas of research that demonstrate children's pragmatic reasoning in context and really kind of focus on relevance. All right. So to give you just a little take that's relevant to ground um, our interpretation of the experimental results, um, let's look at quantity um, and the entailment-based scalar implicatures. Okay, so behind this, we've talked about it already, is that the speaker is being cooperative, right? So this is something that Elizabeth, somewhere, um, focused on in her introduction. Um, so you have to kind of assume that the speaker is being cooperative. And... Um, delivering a maximally informative utterance. They might not always be doing that, but you have to kind of start with the assumption that they are. So you're given a scale of this form where uh, E stands for some sort of lexical item, and in the horn order, E1 would be the strongest term, and E sub N would be um, uh, towards the weaker end. Um, so um, here, I'm kind of switching the order here. This makes more intuitive sense to me. Um, let's say you have a scale of quantity going from sum to all. You've got the quantifiers here. And if a speaker, see this is how I incorporated your slide into my, the speaker is always delivering the utterance. Um, <laughs> the weaker term, on here she implicates that the stronger term doesn't hold, right? So you assert a sub two and that implicates that not a sub one, right? So far so good. Okay. Um, and we could even modify this. Um, so give an alternative E sub 1. If the speaker chooses the weaker lexical item E sub 2, it's either because um, he or she knows that not E sub 1 or doesn't know uh, not E sub 1, right? This is uh, referred to epistemically modifying the scale. Okay, so um, it's after lunch. I thought you guys might need a little bit more engaging images, so here you go. <laughs> I'll just let that stay there for a little bit. All right. Um, so let's say a speaker says that hamster ate some of the strawberry. Um, we can kind of set up our scale of lexical items. Um, we've got some and all on the same scale, the assertion with a weaker lexical item in it, um, all tail some, and so must have meant not hamster ate some, but not all of the story. This is the kind of reasoning that I talked about um, earlier today. Uh, so in this case, if the speaker says hamster ate some, even without partitive construction, um, in other cases, you might think that the speaker means some but not all. The partitive especially kind of enforces that. And um, you get the same and, so the hamster ate the strawberry or the broccoli. Um, the speaker um, utters a weaker term, saying and, the speaker says or, um, which would indicate that um, the hamster eat both. Right? Okay. So in this case, or would be exclusive or, not inclusive or. So that gives you the lay of the land. And of course, scalar implicatures are not restricted to um, and and or, or some and all. It's any kind of lexical items that you can place on a scale um, and order them based on entailment. We'll move beyond that to um, ad hoc scales or Hirschberg type scales in a little bit. But for now, let's focus on these. And I'll give you a glimpse of what we know about how children and adults pattern in experiments that are designed to assess their knowledge of this and their ability to calculate pictures. No talk about experimental work and scalar implicatures would be complete without a reference to Novec 2001. Um, so I am noting for each of these cases what uh, language the um, participants were native speakers of and what language they were assessed in because I think um, a lot of times it's, this kind of gets lost along the way. Um, so I think that people forget that Novik's work was in French and that Papa Frago and Mussolino was in Greek and that, you know, so this is important to uh, keep in mind that there are different um, findings that uh, across different languages that um, allow us to do some kind of cross-linguistic generalization, but you have to be careful about what you're claiming about what people know about the word sum when actually they're being tested with quatre or certain or whatever, right? Okay, so um, here this, um, this study was um, about uh, a number of um, different lexical items, but I'll focus uh, right now on the one um, with might. So might and must are um, scalar alternatives uh, to each other. Uh, so in this particular task, uh, participants were shown three boxes, and um, they were shown that in the first box, there was a parrot. In the second box, there was a parrot and a teddy bear. And um, the participants were not aware of the contents of the third box, but they were told that whatever was in the third box, 
it would be similar to what was in the other boxes, right? So based on the kind of um, you know, reasoning that you would do about the contents of the box, you could say, well, the first two boxes both had a parrot, so this one has to have a parrot. It must have a parrot, right? Um, it might have a teddy bear, only, only might because the first one didn't have one, but the second one did have one. So the probability of the third box having a teddy bear is not one, but the probability of having a, a parrot in it is one. So the speaker in the experiment delivers the utterance, there might be a parrot in the box. Do you guys agree or disagree? Raise your hand if you think that's true, there might be a parrot in the box. Okay, so you guys are very logical. Okay. Um, in fact, there not only might be, there must be, right? Um, but adults um, it only accepted this sentence about 30% of the time, and children all the way up to um, nine years of age um, accepted it most of the time, right? So this is the first glimpse that children and adults um, uh, diverge in their treatment of sentences like this, right? Adults will say no, and most likely if you ask them why, they'll say, well, there must be a parrot, right? Because they're thinking of these as scalar alternatives. Children were not in that task. Um, um, experiment that was a paper. Um, the participants given sentences like this one, some giraffes have long necks. What do you guys think? Is that true or false? Raise your hand if you agree. Some giraffes have long necks. This is a very semantic <laughs> crowd. Um, okay. You have polluted them. They are non-adult like. Yeah. Okay. So none of you are participating in any of my experiments. Um, <laughs> all right. So most other normal adults who are not taking the summer school ukam. Um, will re reject this statement. Okay, so here, just as a reminder for those of you who agree. So, giraffe long next. Okay. Um, okay, so the acceptance rate that he got was 1%, and children all the way up to 11 years of age accept sentences like this. Okay, now I am just, I'm kidding around with you right now, because subsequent work showed that this 41% is not like each individual participant accepting it 41% of the time, there's actually a lovely bimodal distribution which averages to be 41%. Okay. All right. Um, and this finding was replicated by Guas Italian. Okay. Um, so, second bit of evidence, again, with a different lexical item, that children and adults approach these sentences differently, or at least the output or, um, of their responses is different. Um, um, my colleagues and students and I have done with um, Spanish and Spanish-English bilinguals, and we've extended this to English and uh, Spanish-English bilinguals. So this is um, Jennifer Austin and Liliana Sanchez and our students. Um, and in this task, we presented um, children and adults with a screen in which there were four quadrants. On the upper left quadrant, you see that there are two bears that are sleeping and one bear that's wide awake. I'm going to call that the subset scene because two of the three bears are sleeping. Um, the one on the top right uh, has three bears, all of whom are sleeping. Uh, on the bottom left, there are three bears, but they're all wide awake. And then on the bottom right, there are three bears that are all wide awake, but, some of, but not all of them have a particular property, like they have a honeypot. Why are those two at the bottom? They're distractors, but they're a case where um, you could kind of say all of the bears have a particular property, just like you could say of the top right corner, and of the bottom right corner, some, but not all of them have a property. It's not the relevant property that's going to be part of our sentence that we deliver, but there's a partitive situation, okay? So I'm referring to the top left as the subset reading and the um, one on the top right is the whole set. And the lexical items that we presented to the participants were algunos, unos, and todos. Um, algunos and unos both mean some in Spanish. Are there any native Spanish speakers here? Okay, so do you have a sense that algunos and unos are different for you? Okay. Okay, right. So algunos is, if you kind of decompose it, is this alg and unos. Unos means some and possibly all. And there have been theoretical analyses that say algunos encodes this implicature. What that means, it's kind of funny, like in the lexical representation, but it's still defeasible. Um, but they should pattern differently. So you might have a stronger sense that if I say algunos bears are sleeping, that maybe like the scene on the top left would be a better match than the scene on the top right. Yeah. Usually, are there, I'm mas empty and mas objetos and algunos or en unos? Unos is 
más este típico de y hacia el menos en unos que en otros. Ok, so, unos es some with a tendency that goes to less. Uh -huh. And algunos a tendency to a little more. Perhaps. Perhaps. I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I am not a native speaker, but... Uh, yeah, I you're a native <laughs> so, but I do know that they're both not totos, and totos oh, is the universal oh, quantifier. Okay. Definitely. So, <laughs> good. All right. There are variations on Okay. So, uh, so, in this experiment, we had... Uh, we had and so, it was like... Um, you know, so, the, the um, experimenter where the puppet said, show me where some bears are sleeping or all of the bears are sleeping. Again, using the Spanish. So, you know, algunos or unos or todos, right? Um, and um, what we found was that in Spanish, um, only a sentence with algunos. Um, with unos, adults were at chance, choosing between the subset and the whole set scene. And children were pulled a little bit more towards the whole set. I don't know what this means. It wasn't statistically significant, so I'm not going to make too much of it. Um, you know, it's quite possible that they're differentiating unos and algunos somehow, but they didn't pattern like the adults did with algunos. Um, we did this experiment, and, it, and again, only the adults chose the subset scene when they were presented with some. Okay. So even given this um, this display, and we showed each of them each of the you know the pictures. We brought their attention to each of them. Um, we made sure that they knew the predicate. We also, you know, used objects for which they thought we thought they had the um, name of the lexical item. And um, children did not choose um, one over the other. Um, just in case you're wondering if they were kind of split between the two, they did ultimately choose one of the scenes. And what's interesting is that they were attending to all of the lexical content of the utterances, so they never chose the distractor scenes. It was always split between the two scenes in which there were some or all um, of the bears who were sleeping. Okay. Um, here's another study uh, looking at children and adults and their ability to calculate scalar implicatures, uh, work by Anna Papafragu and Julia Mussolino. Um, the study was conducted in Greek. Uh, they looked at um, scenes where um, all of the characters performed a particular action and then the speaker consistently delivered an underinformative utterance. So in this particular context, Using the truth value judgment task in which a scene was acted out and then afterwards a puppet delivered an utterance. Um, using this particular task, uh, for example, in one trial, each of these dinosaurs uh, ate um, some trees and then the puppet would deliver the utterance, some ate trees. All of you will accept that. Um, but what happened in their study was that adults only accepted it in a half percent of the time and the born to five-year-olds accepted it the vast majority of the time. Okay, so one of the I do want to point out is, um, you know, throughout our journey of looking at the experimental evidence on children's and adults' approaches to scalar implicatures is that we now know, um, you know, more than a decade after these original studies, that using either a within or between subject design makes a huge difference. So Papa Frago and Mussolino had a completely, um, had one particular design where they only used utterances with some, the puppet never delivered utterances with all um, in the course of an experimental session. And they also never had situations in which the dinosaurs ate some but not all of the trees. Right? So we now know, actually, um, by work that's been done in a few of our labs, that when you include different kinds of context and when you include um, different lexical scalar alternatives within a session, children start to take notice and they actually are better at calculating those implicatures because you've made that information available to them. So I'll show you some, a little bit of that evidence in a few minutes. Okay. So in a way, having this as a, an initial baseline kind of tells us children are not normally inclined to do this unless you give them a little boost. Right? Okay. There are exceptions to uh, failing to calculate implicatures. We know that children benefit from additional training. So um, I'll show you in a second what that means. So if, they, if you provide them with some training before the experiment, in the experimental session proper, they benefit from that and are more adult-like. They also benefit pr from prosodic support. So if that lexical item sum hosts a pitch accent, a high pitch accent, um, that helps. 
Um, if you give them additional contextual support in the course of a form of a kind of um, story that unfolds and you're kind of um, uh, highlighting particular aspects of the story to make the delivery of the utterance in the end felicitous and relevant to what's happened, that also helps. Um, and um, different methodological manipulations help. So uh, it might not always be the best way to assess participants' um, ability to calculate implicatures. And finally, um, making the relevant scalar salient actually helps quite a bit. Okay, so here were the original results from Julie Musino's um, experiments. So what we're looking at on the y-axis is the proportion of rejections. And the reason why we're looking at the rejections is that this, there was this assumption that um, adults would reject the underinformative utterance, right? So remember, it's in a context where all of the uh, dinosaurs ate trees, and the puppet says some of the dinosaurs ate trees. They also looked at the case where, say, three horses jumped over a fence, and the puppet says two of the horses jumped over the fence. A case where a character finishes a puzzle, and the puppet says that the character started the puzzle. These are all underinformative utterances. Don't pay attention to what's happening with the numerals because that is a whole other talk we could go into. Um, so just focus on what's happening on the far left set of bars, that's some and all. The gray bars are the adults and the white bars are the children. So notice that the, the gray bar is really high, that's the high rate of rejection from the adults, and the white bar is really low, so children are not rejecting these utterances like adults are. But then they ran a follow-up study in which they proceeded with a training session where they introduced the children to um, a puppet um, or Minnie Mouse and said she says some funny things and then they would show that the way that she describes a dog is like a furry thing with you know four legs and the children would say no it's a dog and she would say oh silly me right um, and so this was a way of highlighting felicity or they didn't really um, account for it this way but really it's conventionality um, and so what you see on the right set of bars now is the, just the children, and now the gray is the old set of results and the white is the new set of results. And again, if you just focus on the um, set of bars on the far left, on that right side graph, you can see that the rate of rejection has gone up significantly. So now children are rejecting about 50% of the time. So now they look more adult-like. They're not completely adult-like, they're not rejecting you know, at a rate that's close to ceiling, but they're rejecting a lot more often than they were before. So the training seems to have told the children there's a better way to say something, maybe a more informative, a more conventional way to say something. Pay attention to that, right? It, the training wasn't about scalar implicatures or quantity or anything like that, but it really seems to have highlighted that for them, and so their performance improved. Um, here's this creative, cute study. Her um, uh, peers and advisors that was um, presented at BU in um, 2005. This is a study, it was in English, but the proceedings paper is a little funny in that it cobbles together some work in English and some work in Spanish. Um, but in this particular study, they had a task where they presented children with these blank faces and they gave them stamps and they gave them instructions like this. Make happy or make some faces happy. Do you guys see the difference between that? Okay. So, in the, and there was an, a third condition too, but I'm not going to focus on that here. In the case where they said, make some faces happy, there's just an expectation that the children are going to stamp the faces just to make some faces happy. But in the condition where they heard, make some faces happy, you get this kind of contrastive accenting on some, and there was an expectation there that um, children would make some, but not all faces happy. Okay, so um, they were looking for this kind of, I know it looked the like they like got mom's lipstick, and like, <laughs> but um, there was an expectation that um, children who heard this pitch accented sum uh, would um, give a partitive response, right? It could be two of the four, it could be three of the four. Um, and so here's what they found in terms of uh, partitive received. First condition, make some faces happy. Adults gave the partitive response 96% of the time, showing that adults think that some signals some but not all, and 100% of the time with some. And the four and five year olds only gave a partitive response about half the time in the first condition, but when they heard some faces happy, 90% of the time they are making some but not all of the faces happy. So pretty cool. 
Um, Dimitri Swiss and Anna Papafragua that's coming up soon, um, which has a you know, really nice design um, and really lovely results, um, showing us that um, when you make the scalar alternatives relevant to children, that really affects their ability to calculate implicature. So they used it within subject design, meaning that within a single session, they manipulated um, presenting children with some and all, so they heard both lexical items within the session, and they also saw a scene in which um, the predicate applied to a, a proper subset or the entire group um, that was in the scene. So for example, they had these um, novel characters called Blickets, and um, maybe three of the four Blickets had an umbrella, and maybe you know, four of the Blickets had, all four of the Blickets had a crayon, um, and so they had different conditions. One condition in which the children heard utterances with all, um, utterances with some, and then some of those uh, utterances were felicitous and some were infelicitous depending on the context. Okay. So, for example, if I were to describe the scene on the right by saying um, some of the blickets have crayons, um, that's infelicitous because all of them do. Um, that would be an okay way of describing the scene on the left, but it would be false to say that all of the blickets have umbrellas for the scene on the left, right? So it's really uh, important that all of that was presented within a single session, right? So the children were getting some utterances and utterances. And what they found was that children are more likely to pass, meaning they're more likely to pattern like adults and uh, reject the in infelicitous sentences when they're in the mixed condition. Um, and what's really interesting is that it wasn't just the miscondition that mattered. What really mattered was that um, the, um, the noun phrase that was delivered, so umbrellas or crayons, um, was relevant to the utterances that were being delivered. So um, if it had to do with calculation of some but not all implicature for umbrellas, it didn't matter that there were other infelicit uh, infelicitous utterances that you know, ap applied to other nouns um, or objects in the same session, um, children were really kind of paying attention to some and all within a particular um, kind of set of objects. So that, that really mattered. So the children were attending to the information that was in the utterance, and they were attending to the relevant scalar alternatives. So their conclusion uh, was that children do not generate the stronger alternative. So if you say an utterance with some, they're not going to automatically think, aha, you could have said all. They're not going to do that spontaneously. Um, and the stronger alternative has to be seen as a relevant alternative, right? So even if you have other utterances with all in there, if you're talking about all of the people eating Subway sandwiches and then the scenes are about like Blickets having umbrellas, that's not relevant to them. Okay. Um, the UCLD conference in, in the fall, um, my colleagues and I presented uh, work um, looking at uh, English, native English speaking children and adults and the Spanish English bilingual children that we've been working with, um, also using a within subject design um, with a truth value judgment task. Um, similar to um, Dimitri's and uh, Anna's work, we included both some and all within an experimental session, and we also had true and felicitous and infelicitous context in one session. Um, so it was really funny, as we were presenting our work, Dimitri came up and he was like, I've got this paper that does the exact same thing. And we were like, yes, our work coincides. Um, so we also found that um, in the case where you have manipulated within a particular experimental session, um, children's performance uh, improves. So, in this case, we're looking at is the monolingual English speakers. adults. Um, the blue is the monolingual children, their native English speakers. And then the blue and white striped uh, bars are the bilingual children. Uh, so in the case where, um, the, so the far left is where um, the puppet delivers an utterance with all, but only some of the characters had the target property, so it's false. And so uh, all three groups are rejecting that utterance. The bilingual children are a little bit noisier than the other groups. Um, but they're still rejecting it. In the case where the puppet delivers an utterance like, all of the boys scored a goal, and in fact all of them did, that's true and everyone's accepting it. Um, in the case where the puppet delivers an underinformative, infelicitous utterance with some, so um, some of the boys scored a goal when in fact all of them did, um, what's interesting here is that the um, adults and the monolingual children trend towards rejecting it, but the bilingual children accept it. And um, in the case where some 
is part of the utterance, and only some but not all of the characters had the, the property, the monolingual adults and the monolingual children accept it as expected, but the bilingual children are rejecting it. So what the bilingual children were doing actually left us scratching our heads. Um, clearly, they're not calculating the implicature in the way that the monolingual children and adults are. They're accepting it in the way that the original children from Papa Fargo and Mussolino were, right, in the in Ironovac study. But what they're doing with the sum cases is pretty interesting. And we think what's happening here is that they're trying to reconcile sum and unos and algunos, and this lexical overlap is hard to sort out in the beginning. And what they end up doing is coming up with a kind of context-based ad hoc interpretation of some. Like in this case, some is two, or it's a majority, or it's more than half. Their justifications seem to indicate this. Um, so this was really unexpected to us, but it shows you that there, there are benefits of looking at monolingual and bilingual populations to kind of try to figure out what interpretation um, people are coming up with in a particular context. Okay, another really nice study um, that shows us that children um, diverge from adults um, in calculating scalar implicatures, but still have um, pragmatic wherewithal from recent work by um, Laura Hochstein and her colleagues um, in English. So um, here I've um, given you a, a normal straight-faced person and a silly person. <laughs> All right, and um, <laughs> in this task, um, uh, we're looking at scalar implicatures. They had um, two uh, characters, each of whom has an apple and a strawberry. You really don't need to worry that the strawberry is like enormous and it's the size of an apple, like suspension of disbelief here. Um, okay, so each character has both a strawberry and an apple. And then um, somebody delivers the utterance, each child has an apple and a strawberry. And the participants had to choose whether it was said by the silly person or the non-silly person. Or they would hear, each child has an apple and a strawberry, and have to figure out, is it said by the silly person or the non-silly person? Does that make sense? Yes? OK. So you would think, in this context, each of them has both a strawberry and an apple. So you should say and, and not or, right? Um, but you can say, I mean, if I said, like, if you have a strawberry or an apple, raise your hand, both of them would raise their hand, right? Um, so if you heard each child has an apple or a strawberry, you might think, who would say that in this context? That must be the silly person, right? Um, and in fact, the four and five-year-olds did not use that kind of reasoning. They were 80 percent correct. They had no idea who would have said that. Um, but they ran a similar type scenario, and it was someone who was blindfolded. Okay, so they couldn't see the scene. And in this particular scenario, there was a cup and she plate. She took both a cup and a plate. And, uh, for example, this tart utterance was, the girl took a cup or a plate who said it. And this time, um, the four-year-olds weren't good at figuring out who said it. The five-year-olds were correct about 70% of the time. So the five-year-olds took the use of or as an indica indication that the person was ignorant. They didn't have enough information, right? Not that they weren't calculating a, you know, a scalar implicature here. That's not relevant. What they, they, took the presence of or in the utterance as signaling that the person didn't know, right? But when they heard the girl took a cup and a plate, they thought the person probably knew, right? Okay. So what they argue is that uh, divergence from adults is not due to, um, it is due to an inability on the part of the children to access the specific lexical alternatives on a given horn scale, and it's not due to their pragmatic or general processing being at fault, right? So the kind of, um, set of studies that we're looking at now that have been coming out in the last five or so years really show us that children do have an ability to deploy pragmatic reasoning. Um, what, what seems to be kind of lagging behind adults is an ability to automatically call up that set of scalar alternatives, right? That makes sense if like one of the things that's developing for you is your lexicon, right? Okay. Um, nice study by Kierke uh, et al. Uh, in 2000, in this particular scene, each farmer um, cleans uh, both a horse and a rabbit. Um, one says, every farmer cleaned a horse or a rabbit. Another speaker says, every farmer cleaned a horse and a rabbit. Who do you think said it better? And, right? Okay, so children know that too. Right? So they're given the choice between the two recognize or and might be a better choice given the situation. Okay. 
Um, Pauline Katsos and Dorothy Bishop have a really great study. Um, how many of you are familiar with this study? No? Okay. So it's using a truth value judgment task, but um, looking for a different kind of behavioral response, which is a little bit more appropriate for calculating scalar implicatures. It's kind of like using a Likert scale, but kid-friendly Likert scale. So instead of rating something on a scale of one to five, you give small, medium, or large strawberries. Okay. Uh, so they had two experiments that they ran with five to six-year-olds. The first experiment used the typical binary judgment, so yes or no. Um, the second study used graded judgment. So if you think that the person said it in a bad way, maybe it's false, maybe it's not such a good thing to say, you give them a, so a small strawberry. If they said it in a really good way, you reward them with a really big strawberry. And then a medium strawberry would re be reserved for like, eh, it's okay, part of it's right, part of it's wrong, something like that. Right? They didn't really talk about like truth value gaps or anything. Let's not go there. But what they found present children with infelicitous utterances in a task that asks them to deliver a binary yes-no judgment. Children only reject the infelicitous responses 26% of the time, meaning that the vast majority of the time they're accepting them. Um, but the results differ when you give them a, the, an ability to provide a graded judgment. So what they concluded was that children are tolerant of the infelicity in a binary judgment task. Um, Meaning that, not that they don't recognize it, they're just tolerant of the infelicity. Um, the caveat here is that, again, they also used a between subject presentation. Okay, so here is the type of task that they administered to um, the children. Um, so the experimenter said to Mr. Caveman, um, let's see what the mouse picks up. And the mouse has a choice of the pumpkins. And the mouse goes and selects each of the carrots one by one. And the experimenter says, Mr. Caveman, what did the mouse pick up? And the caveman says, the mouse picked up some of the carrots. Right? We're seeing the same kind of utterances over and over again. Right? Experiment one, the question was, is he right or is he wrong? Right? In experiment two, the experimenter didn't ask, is he right or is he wrong? They said, well, which strawberry would you give him? Right? So you're assessing the felicity of, or the you know, informativity of the caveman's utterance given that context. All right. And what they found was that five to six year olds awarded the meat strawberry for the infelicitous, the small strawberry for false responses, the largest strawberry for true infelicitous responses, and they gave the medium one for infelicitous responses. Now, I mean, that kind of makes sense that you see a difference between the binary and the graded judgments because in a binary task, what you do is just say, you, you don't have the opportunity of saying it's kind of right, kind of wrong. It's just do you accept it or reject it? So this, is, this medium strawberry response is getting lumped into one of those bins, right? OK, so along with review all of these different uh, results, I'm going to highlight in particular work that we've been doing in my lab. Um, so we've um, asked whether or not children are sensitive to the interaction um, uh, or the conversational goals that are part of a speaker here interaction and whether or not this sensitivity will translate to implicature calculation where children might not otherwise demonstrate this ability. So um, we presented um, with short videos in which a speaker and a hearer interact with each other that kind of highlights the conversational um, purpose of uh, uh, delivering some of these utterances. It you know, highlights the cooperative principle and the speaker and hearer having to work together. Um, so in this particular task, the speaker um, has a basket of objects. It could be markers, it could be toy trucks, it could be books. She holds it um, in a way that um, allows for the viewers of the video to see the contents of the basket and also for the addressee to see the contents of the basket. And then she delivers a, a request of the addressee. Um, so in this case, in Spanish, so she says, por favor, pon, and then algunos, unos, or todos los libros en la mesa. So please put some or all of the books on the table. And then the addressee complies by putting some number of objects on the table. So she might say, please put all of the books on the table. And then the addressee might put two or three of the four books on the table. Or she might put all of the books on the table. right? And then uh, the child was asked, did she do OK? So uh, we ran the English bilingual children and with um, heritage-speaking adults. 
And what you can see, remember we showed you that Spanish language bi bilingual children weren't so great at calculating implicatures, but here they're accepting the correct felicitous responses and they are um, not accepting the infelicitous responses, right? So this is showing us that they are, um, sorry, these are the adult speakers and then here are the children. So this is showing us that they're sensitive to the fact the speaker has delivered an utterance, has asked for something to happen, and the addressee has either done as the speaker's requested or not done as the speaker's requested. So in this case, um, they're rejecting the addressee's actions when the speaker has said, please put all of the books on the table, and the addressee only puts two of the books on the table, and they're also rejecting it when the um, speaker says, please put algunos libros en la mesa, and then she puts all of the books on the table. Okay, what's kind of curious about what happened in this task was that children exhibited a high rate of yes answers, much more so than I've ever seen in any study. It was like a striking amount of yes responses. And I think the reason for that was that nothing really went wrong in the conversational exchange. Like when the speaker says, please put all of the books on the table, the addressee didn't take the basket and like throw it against the wall or like get upset. You know, the speaker didn't storm out of the room. Everyone was happy in the end. They looked at the camera and they smiled. And so in the end, when we said, did she do okay? I think a lot of children thought, well, yeah. I mean, she did take books out of a basket. She put them on the table. They were kind of giving her the benefit of the doubt. So nothing really went wrong. The communication seemed to go through. And I mean, at the end of the day, how, you know, how horrible is that, that she ended up putting three of the books on the table instead of all of the books on the table? I mean, really, what's, what's wrong with that? Um, so this is just kind of a, a methodological footnote just to say, like, if you get responses like this, it's helpful to look back at your experimental materials and see if there's a way that you can tweak them um, and to see, you know, what could be inducing a particular pattern of responses, which is what we did when we ran this with English in a second. All right, so the summary of, um, you know, what we've seen so far is that children don't calculate entailment-based scalar implicatures as readily as adults do. They do calculate those implicatures, they just don't do it immediately. But when you give them increased contextual support, where the stronger alternatives are made relevant, where the conversational goals or felicity are made salient, children perform near or on par with adults. But calculation of lexical pictures is sort of the only in which we're engaged. Um, children have been shown to readily demonstrate pragmatic reasoning outside of lexical entailment-based scalar implicatures with robust results and at an earlier age than they um, calculate scalar implicatures with additional support. Okay, so these other areas, young children demonstrate sensitivity to non-literal meaning intended by the speaker and conversational dynamics. One case has been with particularized conversational implicatures, so these are also known as ad hoc implicatures in the experimental literature. These are implicatures that are dependent context. So the way I'm talking about the difference here, and maybe some of you disagree, but the, the way I'm talking about the difference here is that with some or with or or with might, that lexical item in and of itself might trigger an implicature that a stronger lexical item that's a scalar alternative, um, which is a scale mate, doesn't hold, or more accurately that the proposition that has that uh, lexical alternative doesn't hold true. Um, but these particularized conversational ligatures or PCIs are not associated with lexical scales, and they're not just context like these conversational implicatures are. So I'm going to be one in particular, which is like nothing else quantity implicature. So, so let's look at cute pictures of puppies. Um, so in this case, uh, if I show you two scenes, one in which there's just one little puppy sleeping and one in which there's a puppy and a kitten sleeping, um, it's true in both of these situations that um, you could predict being of a puppy. Um, but um, in one case, there's not just there's a puppy and a kid thing. Um, so um, we can kind of set up a similar scale as we did with and and or all. So if the, if the speaker is sleeping, it's true in both situations, but you might think that the speaker intends reference to, to the scene on the left where there's just a puppy sleeping and not the puppy and the kitten sleeping. That's one of the issues that we've, situations that we've tested. Okay. All right, um, what I'm going to be focusing on is that um, this has been the topic of um, research in adult psycholinguistic literature. So there's a really nice study um, by Richard Brahani and, and colleagues where uh, people watched videos of objects going into boxes. So for example, in this particular trial, they watched a spoon go into box A and a spoon go into box B. 
Now, the person in the video might have seen this, and that was it, and they didn't see the rest of the condition. They might have seen that a fork also went into box A. Then, so a speaker saw the spoons go into the boxes, but the condition they might not have seen A. Then um, a speaker who's in the video utters this um, sentence. The woman put a spoon into box B and a spoon and a fork into box A. Now, what's crucial is that particular part that's highlighted in blue. So what the, the woman put a spoon into, the idea is that they've exhausted reference of the objects that have gone somewhere into some box. And if you saw the entire scene, you would think, aha, that must be about box B and not box A because box A has both a spoon and a fork in it. But if all you saw was spoon and spoon, then you wouldn't be able to make that deduction. You would hear the woman put a spoon into, and you'd be thinking, ah, spoon into where? There's a spoon in both, right? I mean, not that you would get so worked up about it, but <laughs> <laughs> calm down a little. Um, OK, so they looked at anticipatory looks. So when the speaker only saw a partial spoon and spoon, there was no early anticipation of the target. So they're looking at eye tracking. But when the entire sequence, spoon, fork, um, then participants anticipated the correct reference, box B, between the onset of um, into and the point of disambiguation box. So they're doing this rapidly. Okay. Um, Bishop, um, in that same earlier, also provides some information about um, particularized conversational implicatures in child language studies. So in addition to their utterances with some, they also had no, what they called non-scalar um, condition trials. So um, in this case, a dog painted a heart and a triangle. Um, the experimenter asked Mr. Caveman, what did the dog paint? And Mr. Caveman says the dog painted the triangle. That's not as informative as it could be, right? Because he also painted the heart. Um, and in this case, five and six year olds awarded the medium stroke for a non maximal response, right? Um, Papa Froglin, very cute, in which animals were given different jobs. Um, a bear was given the really hard job of eating a sandwich. Um, then the experimenter said, did you eat the sandwich? And he said, I ate the cheese. Or there was a some presence, and the experimenter said, did you wrap the gifts? And he said, I wrapped a carrot. Four and six year olds generally refuse to give the prize to the animal in these cases. Okay. <laughs> Lovely study, again, I love all of these studies, so I'm just going to say they're all beautiful, uh, by Alex Stiller and colleagues um, uh, coming out of Stanford. So in this study, it's so simple. So they were able to run the study with two to four-year-olds. Um, they had a set of, I think it was four trials in total. In each of the trials, they had a set of um, three objects. Um, here, there was a smiley face that was a distractor. It had no additional accessories or anything. The second one had one feature. He was wearing sunglasses or glasses. And in the third, he had glasses and he had a hat on. So you can kind of see that this is similar to the sum all scale with respect to like how many relevant accessories does the um, character have. And the experimenter children, my friend has glasses. And they looked at whether or not the children would be able to figure out which of the smiley faces um, was the intended referent. Very simple task, right? The adults, fine. They knew exactly which, uh, which smiley face to select. It was the one that just had the glasses and not the glasses plus something else. By three and a half years of age, children are also patterning like adults. Okay. So on the x-axis, you see a three and four, the proportion of choices of the object with one feature, two features, or no features at all. So the two-year-olds had a little bit of difficulty with this, but you can kind of see the lines diverging by the time they get to three or three and a half. They're really just choosing the one with one feature, right? And they're not choosing the one that has two features, meaning the person said, my friend has glasses, and it's glasses and nothing else. Okay. So, research in my lab, we're going to take the presence of a singular sub as a signal that the speaker intends reference to a scene where only that agent is doing the relevant action. Um, um, we got animal costumes, and we dressed up as pigs and ducks. Um, 